Chapter Twenty Three of Mary, a Fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. Mary, a Fiction by Mary Wollstonecraft. Chapter Twenty Three. Unhappy, she wandered about the village and relieved the poor. It was the only employment that eased her aching heart. She became more intimate with misery, the misery that rises from poverty and the want of education. She was in the vicinity of a great city. The vicious poor, in and about it, must ever grieve a benevolent contemplative mind. One evening, a man who stood weeping in a little lane near the house she resided in caught her eye. She accosted him. In a confused manner, he informed her that his wife was dying and his children crying for the bread he could not earn. Mary desired to be conducted to his habitation. It was not very distant, and was the upper room in an old mansion house, which had once been the abode of luxury. Some tattered shreds of rich hangings still remained, covered with cobwebs and filth. Round the ceiling, through which the rain dropped, was a beautiful cornice mouldering, and a spacious gallery was rendered dark by the broken windows being blocked up. Through the apertures the wind forced its way in hollow sounds and reverberated along the former scene of festivity. It was crowded with inhabitants. Some were scolding, others swearing, or singing indecent songs. What a sight for Mary! Her blood ran cold, yet she had sufficient resolution to mount to the top of the house. On the floor, in one corner of a very small room, lay an emaciated figure of a woman. A window over her head scarcely admitted any light, for the broken panes were stuffed with dirty rags. Near her were five children, all young and covered with dirt. Their sallow cheeks and languid eyes exhibited none of the charms of childhood. Some were fighting, and others crying for food. Their yells were mixed with their mother's groans, and the wind which rushed through the passage. Mary was petrified, but, soon assuming more courage, approached the bed, and, regardless of the surrounding nastiness, knelt down by the poor wretch, and breathed the most poisonous air, for the unfortunate creature was dying of a putrid fever, the consequence of dirt and want. Their state did not require much explanation. Mary sent the husband for a poor neighbor, whom she hired to nurse the woman and take care of the children, and then went herself to buy them some necessaries at a shop not far distant. Her knowledge of physic had enabled her to prescribe for the woman, and she left the house with a mixture of horror and satisfaction. She visited them every day and procured them every comfort. Contrary to her expectation, the woman began to recover. Cleanliness and wholesome food had a wonderful effect, and Mary saw her rising as if it were from the grave. Not aware of the danger she ran into, she did not think of it till she perceived she had caught the fever. It made such an alarming progress that she was prevailed on to send for a physician, but the disorder was so violent that for some days it baffled his skill, and Mary felt not her danger as she was delirious. After the crisis, the symptoms were more favorable, and she slowly recovered without regaining much strength or spirits. Indeed, they were intolerably low. She wanted a tender nurse. For some time she had observed that she was not treated with the same respect as formerly. Her favors were forgotten when no more were expected. This ingratitude hurt her, as did a similar instance in the woman who came out of the ship. Mary had hitherto supported her. As her finances were growing low, she hinted to her that she ought to try to earn her own subsistence. The woman in return loaded her with abuse. Two months were elapsed. She had not seen or heard from Henry. He was sick, nay, perhaps had forgotten her. All the world was dreary, and all the people ungrateful. She sunk into apathy, and, endeavoring to rouse herself out of it, she wrote in her book another fragment. Surely life is a dream, a frightful one. And after those rude, disjointed images are fled, will light ever break in? Shall I ever feel joy? Do all suffer like me, or am I framed so as to be particularly susceptible of misery? It is true, I have experienced the most rapturous emotions, short-lived delight, ethereal beam which only serves to show my present misery. Yet lie still, my throbbing heart, or burst, in my brain, why dost thou whirl at such a terrifying rate? Why do thoughts so rapidly rush into my mind, and yet, when they disappear, leave such deep traces? I could almost wish for the madman's happiness, and in a strong imagination lose a sense of woe. O oh, reason, thou boasted guide, why desert me like the world when I most need thy assistance? Canst thou not calm this internal tumult, and drive away the death-like sadness which presses so sorely on me, a sadness surely very near allied to despair? I am now the prey of apathy. I could wish for the former storms. A ray of hope sometimes illumined my path. I had a pursuit, but now it visits not my haunts forlorn. Too well have I loved my fellow creatures. I have been wounded by ingratitude. From every one it has something of the serpent's tooth. 
When overwhelmed by sorrow, I have met unkindness. I looked for someone to have pity on me, but found none. The healing balm of sympathy is denied. I weep a solitary wretch, and the hot tears scald my cheeks. I have not the medicine of life, the dear chimera I have so often chased. A friend. Shade of my loved Anne. Dost thou ever visit thy poor Mary? Refined spirit, thou wouldst weep, could angels weep, to see her struggling with passions she cannot subdue, and feelings which corrode her small portion of comfort. She could not write any more. She wished herself far distant from all human society. A thick gloom spread itself over her mind, but did not make her forget the very being she wished to fly from. She sent for the poor woman she found in the garret, gave her money to clothe herself and children, and buy some furniture for a little hut in a large garden, the master of which agreed to employ her husband, who had been bred a gardener. Mary promised to visit the family and see their new abode when she was able to go out. End of chapter 23